Hi, and welcome to Access Chat. I'm really delighted that we have John Donovan with us today. John is co-author of In a Different Key, The Story of Autism. Uh, you, you've also got a long history as a, a journalist, both as a f foreign and, and political correspondent, um, and also as a presenter of, of, sort of topical debates. So, uh, delighted to have you with us. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came to, to start writing a, on this topic? Um, it started in a bit of a personal way. My co-author, Karen Zucker, um, is the mother of a now 21-year-old man with autism. Back in the 90s, when he was diagnosed in 96 as a little boy, Karen and I were colleagues at American television, ABC News. And uh, we were, you know, regular reporters covered, as you said, the broad range of things, foreign stories and political stories. Um, but Karen at that time was quite bothered by the fact that she had a difficult time explaining to other people uh, what autism was. It really wasn't a tip of the tongue kind of uh, term in that period, believe it or not. And she wanted to begin doing stories that explored the issues and challenges of autism for individuals and families um, outside of the category that was typically done, which was usually you know, stories about savant skills um, or very often stories about miracle cures, quote-unquote. Uh, she wanted to do stories about the real experience of people with autism, therapies, uh, challenges in the family, uh, discrimination against people with autism, bullying of people with autism, siblings of people with autism, uh, aut autism in girls and how that was a different set of challenge. And so um, she came to me because we worked together so often, but also because she knew that I had a, br a brother-in-law with autism. Uh, I have a brother-in-law who's now in his late 40s, who lives in Israel. And um, he he's nonverbal, uh, not independent in life. And so through my wife, I had um, some idea about what autism was like and the kind of autism that he had. And so we teamed up as um, reporters on autism in the beginning, to be honest, when we went to ABC and said we'd like to do stories about autism. They didn't know what we were talking about. And it was a little bit of a, of a push to get them to say yes, but they ultimately did. And we started doing a series through the early 2000s that we called Echoes of Autism and um, covered those kinds of issues. But around 2005 or 6, we, we really decided that we wanted to do a, a book and we wanted to do a book about the past because we had, we had ourselves lived through that past, through the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, when people didn't really talk about autism. But we had learned that there really was an autism story going on in that period that hadn't been told. And so we decided to go tell it, find out what it was, and tell it. Exactly. And, and it's, it's a big book, so it's no wonder you've had a long gestation period. Yeah. Uh, I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm only about a third of the way through so far, but it's, it's, uh, it's compelling reading, and uh, I'm, I'm absolutely going to plow my way through the rest of it. And I, I think Deborah's a few days ahead of me, so Deborah, you've read a bit more than me. So do you want to uh, lead in with the next question? Yes, thank you. And John, welcome. Welcome thank to you. Access Thanks Chat. So we were very um, excited to have you on. And um, I, I've been reading it from the perspective of a parent because I have a daughter with Down syndrome. And we're finding more and more that um, the people with there's a subgroup of people with Down syndrome that also have autism. And so, um, and I see my daughter um, who's 28 years old, and, and I consider her high functioning, but I see um, displays of certain autistic behaviors mm -hmm. in her. Uh, I was at a conference speaking the other day, and I brought up when she was a little girl, I, I hated to, um, if there was a thread on her sweater or something, mm -hmm. <laughs> she could not help herself. By the time she got home, the, she, one sleeve would be gone. So, um, <laughs> and you know, I pick at things too. So, But I, I do Mine. think it's interesting, yeah, I, I think it was interesting as you're, uh, as you're telling the story from the, you know, such a long part of the story, how, will you talk a little bit about, because I know some people are saying this book has just been written from the parents' viewpoint, which I found that was the case early on, but not so much as I will get on in the book. So can yeah, you address I mean, that a little? Well, parents play a big part in the book uh, because it's a history. And in the history of autism, parents played a very big part. Um, uh, we we cover basically we would cover seven or eight decades, and during the the first the second third fourth fifth sixth even decades of that period, the the 
the battles that needed to be fought, the campaigns that needed to be taken on and won, were, par were battles where parents were the ones who stepped in. Society at large was not giving any help to individuals with autism. As a rule, um, people with autism were being sent to institutions. That's what their parents were told to do by the professionals. Uh, definitely, as a rule, in the United States, children with autism did not have a right to public education. So they were, again, in institutions or uh, maximally at home. And that all changed only because one group of people did st stood up to do something about it, and that was the parents. And so the parents are the protagonists of the first 20 to 30 to 40 years of the campaigns that were fought. Now, you, of course, there were people with autism all of that time, all along. They weren't just children. They were also adults. Autism, as it was defined in, in that period of time, was a, a far narrower uh, uh, description of much greater impairment than is recognized today by the broader autism spectrum. But people on the spectrum were, were not battlers. They were not the ones going to court. They were not the ones finding the school systems. They were not the ones shutting down institutions. They were not the ones lobbying for therapies. That was all undertaken by parents, parents who were amateurs, who knew nothing when they began, who not only knew nothing when they began, but had the system against them. Parents were blamed for causing autism. They were considered uh, pains in the neck. Uh, we tell a story about a, f a family that went down to the local school district in Santa Barbara with protest, with, with banners and, and placards to protest for the right to their child to get education. And what happened was that the school superintendent, who told us this story himself, looked out the window and saw them and ordered his maintenance man to turn on the water sprinklers on the lawn to drive them away. And he thought that was very funny. I mean, even 40 years later, he still thought that was kind of a funny story oh, to tell. Wow. So we tell this, we focus on parents because our book is about how society changed in its regard to people with autism. And the biggest agents of making that change happen through the first 40 or 50 years were parents. There were also researchers, there were lawyers, there were activists, there were civil rights campaigners. Um, in the 90s, that began to change. Uh, the definition of autism grew larger. Uh, people with language uh, who could speak, who could communicate in the typical way or nearly typical way began to advocate for themselves. And in the 90s, you begin to see people with autism also entering into the story. So the fact is, we tell the story that's of, of who was out there making news, making the changes. And for the first 40 or 50 years, it was parents by themselves. After that, self-advocates came into it. Now we live in a world where um, they're all, we hope, we're, they're all in the barricades together. Right. John, what, what, was, what did y'all hope to accomplish by writing this book? As I'm reading it, it it's... It's, it's some parts of it's uh, it's hard to read because we it's it's a very complex history and um, it, it's just very interesting watching it unfold because there was a lot of it that I didn't know but what were you and Karen trying to would you want to accomplish from writing it we wanted people to be inspired by the past to move into the future and to take on the battles that have yet to be fought on behalf of people on the spectrum. So some of what I just said, so awfully, there were some awfully difficult bad things that happened in the 50s and the 60s, the institutionalization, um, the discrimination, the dehumanization of uh, people with autism. In those days it would have been said children with autism, but those children all became adults. Um, the, the way in which they were neglected, the way in which science paid no attention to them, schools ignored them or shut them out. All of those things people stood up to and changed. And they did it with courage, with grit, with sweat, with ingenuity, with resolve, with love. And what we wanted to say is, look how far we've come. Did you know things used to be that bad? And look how far we've come how much has been overcome. Let's be inspired by that so that in the future we know where to go. We know what has to be done. We know what works. And the other thing is we really wanted to write the book in such a way that this is not just a book for the autism community. It's a book about the autism community, but the idea is that we want the rest of the world to know that they play a part in how people with autism experience their world, how they're treated, and their families and that we all have a part in it, that we can either be part of the problem for people who are on the spectrum, or we can be part of the solution. And we tell a story near the end of the book, you haven't gotten to it yet, 
but it's a, it's a scene that took place on a bus in New Jersey in 2006 actually happened where there was a young man with autism riding by himself in the front seat and in fact he was he was not verbal he was uh, he was uh, working towards independence and part of his independence was getting lessons in how to use public transportation and there was a teacher sitting towards the back of the seat who had been gradually fading towards the back of the bus so the young man could ride by himself so to the passengers that day, it looked like the young man was riding by himself, and two guys get on the bus, and they sit behind him, and they start harassing him because he's making noises, and he's rocking in his seat, he's flipping his fingers, he's stimming, and this bothers them. And so they lean in, and they say to him, hey, you know, man, what's your problem? Cut it out. And the teacher in the back of the bus starts moving forward to intervene, but he's blocked by another passenger who stands up, and that other passenger walks up to these two guys and says, you know, back off. What's his problem? What's your problem? He's got autism. How about you leave him alone? And in that moment, according to the teacher on the bus who told us the story, you could, he said you could feel the whole bus lined up behind that young man. And what we want, that we wrote our book for all of the people on the bus to be the guys who stand up and have the back of that young man and people like him and not be the bullies. To recognize the humanity, to accept, to encourage, to root for, to cheer for every success and to to have the back of people who need a little support from time to time. It was a beautiful story. And you know, I always say, and I know that Antonio has a question, but I always say that the people with autism, they just use their brain differently. And there's value to society, and it's all using as much of our, our brains as we can. So, um, Antonio, I know you have a question. Uh, I have a, a very good friend. Uh, that found that was found a few a few years ago when his kid was four, that he was autistic. So during that period, he was facing um, quite the amount of levels of stress at work. He was completely desperate. You know, he was dealing with the situation that he didn't he didn't know anything about it. But you know, but by looking to his story, what I found is the love that he had for the kid in order to be able to find the solution and to progress and to help him had a very important role in the way I was a, he was able to look for assistant he, he was end up traveling to Spain where the kid was able was doing some therapy he found a dog that is part of the kid's life today so love seems to be a very important aspect of all this can you elaborate on that you know what is important you know for for a parent and the way how he loves his kid, what is the role of love in all in all this in in this relationship? Well, yeah, we we say in the preface to our book and in the end of our book that parental love has been one of the great drivers forward in the history of autism, um, by which we mean that's what fueled um, all of the changes that came about. And again, these are changes that people don't appreciate because now we're in the world where those changes have taken effect, but. We, we tell the story in the book of the first child diagnosed in the medical literature, um, a young boy named Donald, who is still alive today, and he's had a wonderful outcome in life. Um, his name is Donald Triplett. He lives in a little town in Mississippi. And his parents did put him in an institution when he was three years old, back in 1937. That's what everybody was told to do. They were, in fact, told... They weren't told, don't love your child anymore, but they were told, move on, forget about your child. And his parents obeyed that instruction, but then they just changed their minds. He was there several months, and they just, they just said, we gave up too early. And the fact that we now know about a concept called autism and a diagnosis called, called autism, and it became known in the medical literature, is because those parents, through their love, wouldn't give up on that kid. And they got him to Baltimore, where he was seen by Leo Connor, who wrote the seminal article on autism. Um, and, and that love comes up again and again and again in my own mother-in-law. Um, when her son was diagnosed in approximately 1968 in Israel, she was told uh, he's going to need to be institutionalized. And um, she went to see the institution that Israel offered. And it was horrible. It was a snake pit. And she told me she looked at the place she spent about 15 minutes there and she just said no way and so what she did was she gave up her career as a musician and she went out and with some other families started a, built a school literally built a school I've been in the school they built it's a real place with bricks in a field that didn't used to be there it was built in the 70s and then they built another school and another school and then they began building residential communities 
that was her love for her son. I'm not going to give up on my son. You know, this this love comes with a burden as well. There's, uh, Karen, my co-author, says there's always a sense of guilt. Am I doing enough? Should I be doing more? Um, but she, you know, her her love for her son is is just boundless. I mean, she thinks about him, talks about him, supports him all the time. When we were writing the book, again and again and again, it would happen where we she's she we we live a couple hundred miles apart. She lives in New Jersey. I live in Washington. And we'd be on the phone going over some page or something like that. Happened again and again. I gotta go. I gotta go. Mickey's running out in traffic. I gotta go. I gotta go. He's he's pulling down the furniture. I mean, over years and years and years, the she had she was always she was always watching out for him. A piece of her mind was always with him, and that was love. And so we completely believe that love drives the story forward, and will continue to do so. It's a great question. That is a great question. So um, and and obviously. Love or lack of it comes up a lot in the book because there's the assumption of the refrigerator mothers, uh, um, yeah. the, the you know, ridiculous theory that that existed, which must have been terrible for for the parents. But um, it, it, it's interesting because obviously we talk about the progression um, of how people are, are perceived today and. Also, I think that technology now has a role to play. That where someone that was nonverbal before basically couldn't communicate, there are tools now available that, so that people that are permanently nonverbal or who regress, because I know people who are brilliant, in fact, colleagues who have regressed and gone nonverbal for periods of time, are able to communicate by either using AAC or by by messaging, etc. So that the the goalposts have moved now, and um, people are able to advocate for themselves where they couldn't before. But that's because of all of the work that's gone on before. Yeah, and it's also you know it's also an attempt was made a greater attempt was made to listen, to 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 try to listen to try to hear. And again, I know uh, we tell the story of a mother named Liz Bell. Her son is really almost completely nonverbal. And yet she feels that she knows what he's saying. She, she can read him. Um, and she can read him with accuracy. I mean, she, she can tell that you know, when he needs you know, a particular something out of the refrigerator, say. Um, she, she knows what that is. She's, she's, it's not ESP. But it's reading his signals, and mm -hmm. his response tells her that she's read him correctly. Um, and so, I do think it's absolutely true that not not only have uh, have ways been found for people to communicate who were considered incommunicative before, um, but that um, but that we've we've we're we're much better at trying to figure out how to listen. That much better at 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 recognizing that there's a that there's that there's a you know a, that we're talking to about a human being, we're talking about a person. That said, I mean, sometimes the arguments are sort of put in terms of, um, oh, look how skilled that person is, or oh, look how much that person can contribute to society. And and in some ways, that makes me a little bit uncomfortable because the argument seems to be almost, we should respect that person because they can contribute. And I would say mm, we should respect that person because that person is a person. And um, um, we should give that person all support to reach his or her full potential. But if if his or her full potential turns out to come up somewhat short to holding a full-time job or being a taxpayer, I, I would be concerned that the lo the counter logic of that argument being, well, if that person's not a taxpayer or a full-time employee, then they don't deserve our full respect and support. But I would say they do. They do, regardless. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And... Um... As we go into the future with greater automation and robotics and everything else, there'll be a lot more of us that may not hold down full-time jobs either. <laughs> I've been thinking about the same thing a lot lately. Um, so I, I I agree with you in, on on that point. I I do think that there's a that an interesting and and tricky question, which is is around the idea of, of cures for neurodiverse conditions, which is something that taxes me quite quite a lot. Uh, and, and that is, you know, how much should we be wanting to cure? So not just with, with autism, but with things like dyslexia. So, um, you know, personally, I'm, I'm dyslexic. I wouldn't want to be anything other than me, despite the challenges that it, it 
brings to me. Um, and yet, I know that there are people who are uh, at a different end of the spectrum that find much greater difficulty than me that may wish that some of the things that they struggle with didn't happen to them. So there is a really tricky ethical dilemma mm -hmm. um, as to what do we do for searching f for a cure? And I, and I know that, that this was an area that, um, that exercises the, the autism community a, a great deal, and it's, uh, especially the, the autism self-advocacy movement where we're talking about um, you know, people saying, yeah, well, we are complete people regardless of how you view us. We're just wired different, um, and we don't, we don't need curing. Where do you sit uh, uh, along that along that line as to where, how far should research go? Do you think? And I know that's a tricky question. So, well, you're you're absolutely putting your finger on probably the what's today the main fault line in the conversation about autism. If you're inside the community, I think outside the autism community, this conversation is seems somewhat obscure. Um, I think most people outside the autism community um, w w would sort of say, oh, if you can cure it, you should cure it. Obviously, it's much more, it's much more complicated than that because I, I think part of the reason is we aren't all agreed on what we mean by it when we say cure it. Correct. Um, uh, autism, and this is a theme of our book, autism is a very, very poorly defined term. When we started writing the book, we kind of assumed that we assumed, uh, not knowing where we were going with this, when I say we, Karen and myself, that everybody who was using the word autism meant the same thing by it. But that has not ever been true. It's not true across time. It's not true from place to place. Um, the definition is a bit of a mess. It's grown and shrunk and grown and shrunk, Asperger's in, Asperger's out at the stroke of a pen, all of which indicates that we're not necessarily talking about the same thing when we talk about autism. And... I, it's our sense that research is going to lead potentially to the idea that there are different autisms that um, that the that the typical what behaviors, if we can even agree on what the typical behaviors are, may be the result of all kinds of different pathways and mechanisms, um, and so that complicates things. But then to get to your, the point of your question, well, what do you do about this? I go with Karen's answer to it, which is if. If there's an individual who, um, like, such as yourself, with, with as you say with dyslexia, you, you're you, you're okay with it. Um, you, you you it's who you are. It's part of your identity. You don't you don't want that to stop. You're it's familiar. It's you're good with it. There's no reason that anybody should pressure you to cure or talk about a cure. Nor should they, in my view, uh, diminish you. Uh, disparage you or uh, discriminate against you because you're good with it. So, you know, we, we everybody's got something um, and um, some sort of difference one way or another. And if they, if they want to embrace it, if I want to embrace my differences, then let's do it. Let's go for it. Karen's answer, though, is, but if you're an individual whose opportunities in life, whose ability to have independence in particular, but to explore, to grow, to reach potential is severely, severely limited by some manifestation of whatever this thing is, this vague thing that we call autism. If there's, a, if there's in particular in the extreme case, but it's not so extreme that it's made up, self-injurious people hurting themselves, banging their heads against the wall, and something can be done to stop that behavior. And she says, why would, you in, why would you not stop that behavior? Why would you not step in? Now, Karen doesn't call that cure. She calls that treatment. And, and and we think the word cure is somewhat problematic because it's so all-encompassing. I agree. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it, 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 it does represent something that's probably, first of all, impossible. You can't, you, can't, you can't cure autism. I mean, autism is way too complex. It's way too endemic in who the person is. But you can do something about, the, uh, about some of the challenges. And so uh, in terms of research, um, we're all for research that helps um, helps with the, uh, reducing those limitations in a person's life. And uh, and if if there's an individual who says, "Leave me alone, I'm good the way I am," 
leave that person alone. It's good the way they are. The question becomes who speaks for whom. That's where things get. That's where things get thorny. So, so far, that's, a, that's a, that, There's no. In my view, there's no clear answer to that question at this point. Um, so I, I know I, I'm hogging it a bit, but um, I just want to come back on on that, and I think it's. I think I'm fairly well aligned with your answer here. Um, I don't want necessarily treatment, but I use assistive technologies. I use technologies as those treatments. I find ways and workarounds to, to deal with the issues that I, I, I have difficulty with. So I think that continued research uh, into both technology, into all sorts of um, different aspects to make people's lives better. Absolutely uh, applaud that, encourage that and everything else. So um, I think I'm with you on that. So um, Antonio. I'm wearing eyeglasses. Yeah. They don't change who I am whatsoever, no. but they sure make, I can see you clearly right now because they are kind of technology. Yeah. You know, that seems to be the zone where you're comfortable with. If, if it helps me be who I am better, if it helps me communicate better without changing who I am, I get that. Yeah. I get that totally. So, so I, I think that a long time ago, if you before we invented glasses, you would have been disadvantaged. Totally. Um, or possibly did now, because I wouldn't have seen the bear coming. Yeah. So <laughs> absolutely. So so as technology improves, what becomes normal and accepted by society um, then changes and morphs. Yes. We, we you know we. <laughs> Unfortunately, we had to cut a lot of our book. Uh, it was 45% longer, and you know how big it is already. Gotcha. But one of the things yeah. we one of the things we cut out was a discussion about the meaning of accommodations, uh, the meaning of accommodations, and how they actually move the line for what's quote unquote considered normal. I know that when I was a kid, living in New York City, it was impossible for people in wheelchairs to go out to get out. The reason being, there were curbs every you know, every 200 feet there's a curb to cross the street and they couldn't get up or down the curb. And then, you know, the laws changed and curb cuts were instituted all over the country. And my children grew up in a world where seeing somebody who's moving about with the assistance of a wheelchair is so non-remarkable. It's, it's, they're, they're, the, the, when I was a kid, it was, it, it's removed the it's remove the not normal label to seeing a person who can't use his lower limbs uh, because of, because that person's everywhere, everywhere, and the buses lift them up and and full mobility, and that accommodation, a form of technology, I suppose, re removed the stigmatization of not normal from uh, in, in a way that was very heavy and dark and limiting in a person's life. Uh, does the person still need to use a wheelchair? Yes, but that doesn't. That's the, the meaning of it has changed completely because of technology. And I can I consider that I'm glad I got to see that happen in my lifetime. You know, my days ahead when I may be in a wheelchair, my, I, I might still be somebody who needs to use a wheelchair in life. I'm glad the world has changed that way for me because because uh, I wouldn't want the stigma. And and it does show how thing how things can move. Excellent. Antonio, I know you've got a question. Uh, over over the, the the last year, the the past year, we had different conversations around accessibility from from people from different parts of the world, where we're able to identify that some country is doing something really well in an area, while another country is better on another one. But you know, somehow uh, it's possible to learn from best practices all over the world. Is that f from your research when you were preparing, uh, when when you and Karen were working on uh, on the book? Uh, is there something that you can tell us about how the, the world sees autism and how you know what are the areas that uh, s somehow here there are still a lot of uh, unknown and there's. And it's it's important to that international organizations should also have a role in the, in the way uh, how they explain this. Well, again, it's a chapter that was cut from our book, but we um, we did a chapter on international uh, on on different cultures. We went to a lot of different countries and looked at how those countries understand autism, what they understand autism to be, and how they process it, and found dramatically 
st very dramatic differences uh, among cultures. Um, in um, in France, for example, uh, there's still a tendency to uh, to think that the parents are responsible for causing autism. That's beginning to fade now. That is echoed in Vietnam uh, because of the French influence. Um, going back to the 40s and 50s, uh, the psychiatric industries in, in both of these nations still have a tendency to think that the, something needs to be done for the parents in order to treat the child's autism. Um, in South Africa, Karen spent uh, uh, several days driving around with um, uh, two uh, activists in South Africa who are attempting to modernize their approach to um, to autism, including um, awareness, for, for one thing. And she found that one of their battles, um, when they get outside of the big cities and into the tribal areas, is that um, um, a lot there's still a tendency to see autism as a form of demonic possession, or at least some sort of spiritual malaise caused by sins committed by the ancestors and so the treatment for children with autism there has a religious component to it going to a spiritual healer who uses charms and things like that rather than first of all that's very stigmatizing uh, and secondly it, uh, I personally don't believe that autism is going to be addressed by the use of charms and and so there are activists who are attempting to uh, to change that position uh, in um, I went to Israel and Palestine um, and in Palestine, there's still an enormous stigma associated with the disabilities that we call autism. And the reason I keep saying we call autism is that we came away from the book really convinced that autism is a provisional concept. Um, and uh, I met a I met a, t a teacher in uh, Nazareth who um, whose education um, she was educated in Canada. Uh, to, to be a special education teacher and she runs a school there but she told me how families she knows one family that has twin twins both have autism who attend her school but the parents every day drive the children to another town nearby so that they can get a bus back to the school so that the neighbors don't find out that their children are going to this school because they're so ashamed of it um, in Jerusalem, you may know this, in Jerusalem in the late 90s, there was a, a cult kind of around uh, in, in some very small sects of the extreme Orthodox community there where uh, children with autism were seen to be divinely inspired, the opposite of the South African uh, experience. And they, they would put children on stage and working with a facilitator using facilitated communication the community would have what they thought were conversations with God through this child on the stage. So those are all just a few examples, Antonio, of, of the vast cultural uh, differences. You know what I would say the greatest challenge back in, you know, our worlds, you know, um, you're in Ireland um, and, and also the U.S. and the U.K. We haven't done very well in embracing adults with autism. Um, We've come a long way uh, over the last 50 or 60 years in, in finding a place in the world and in our hearts for accepting and embracing and loving kids with autism. And those were not, that was not easy. Kids with autism used to be considered, you know, society wanted them kept at a distance. We've come a long, long way in that regard now. You know, we, we, applaud, we applaud programs like special movie showings and screenings for kids with autism where they turn down the sound or we honor barbers and dentists who make a practice out of giving treatment to kids with autism who who would otherwise freak out at the being put in a chair and having somebody fiddling with their hair or with their mouths because of the tactile issues. We applaud those people. We they get stories in the media. They get honored. Um, uh, we're we're seeing TV shows have autistic children. Uh, Sesame Street has an autistic character, a little girl now. We're, we've come a long way on the kids. Not perfect, but a long way. It's not the same with adults. Um, we have not really made room yet for adults with autism. And when I say adults with autism, I'm speaking about people at that end of the spectrum who, who are not going to be verbal, who may, who may not, you know, present neatly, who may, you know, their clothes may be disheveled, um, they may not shave. Uh, 
those sorts of people still in, inspire, unfortunately, they inspire fear and, and shunning and revulsion, lack of support. A lot of them end up in jail because the cops don't know how to deal with them. They don't understand that a, a meltdown is not aggressive but is a internal, internal turmoil. We have, a, we have a long, long way to go okay. with accepting adults with autism and embracing, uh, embracing who they are as they are and giving them support. And that's, you know, when you asked about Karen and, and I writing the book, when we say we want to use the past to inspire, that, that thing we want to inspire is, is the battle for the future. And we think one of the biggest ones is is turning the corner on finding a space in the world for adults with autism as well and including them, rooting for them, rooting for them as part of us. Okay, that's, yeah, I think that's really, really important because autism doesn't go away. Yeah. You, 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 your childhood is only a small part of your, your entire lifespan, so uh, I think that is one of the areas where it's seldom addressed. It's something that I'm doing some work with uh, with some colleagues who are autistic who are trying to address autism in the workplace and that includes the people that are nonverbal because it's possible yeah. um, to, to hold down to hold down the job totally. and, and, totally. and be nonverbal um, but it's it's not the norm yet and, and we so we've, we've got a long way to go and, um, it's, and it can so totally be the norm it's it, yeah. it really is it's a decision that society as a whole needs to make yeah. it can so totally be the norm and I think I think we will get there, but it's a, it's a journey that we have to travel. Yeah. Uh, and your book is documenting that journey, and it's one that will continue. So I know we've reached the end of our our time on air, and I know your battery's about to go flat too. So um, thank you very much, John. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. It's been a pleasure, and it's been an honor, really. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thanks.